Diverticulosis and diverticulitis are very similar. Diverticulosis is just the condition of having the diverticula or the outpouching inside of the colon and like it creates little pockets and diverticulitis is when one of those little pockets with the diverticula become inflamed and infected. We call that diverticulitis. So diverticulosis is a herniation of the GI tract mucosa which creates pockets or outpouching. It's asymptomatic. There's no, um, you don't know you have it unless you have a colonoscopy and you see it on the scope. Diverticulitis is when it becomes inflamed and it's mainly in the colon. So what we want to say it's related to low fiber intake or maybe it's genetic um, inflammatory processes and abscess maybe. It can develop later into a, a fistular type connections with the bladder if it's uh, left untreated. For assessment findings, uh, you'll notice the client may have alternating constipation and diarrhea, rectal bleeding, um, main, mainly that's because that the diverticula has outpouched along a vessel on the colon wall and that creates some bleeding there. And sometimes they'll present as a GI bleed as a result of that. They may have a history of intestinal diverticula and they may have increased white blood cells. So for patients who present with diverticulitis, they'll do a CT scan to see if there's any inflammation in the colon. They may do a barium enema to look for infl inflammation in the pockets, the diverticula pockets, or a colonoscopy to visually examine it. Stool samples will be taken to look at presence of an infectious process like C. diff or um, blood in the stool. We tell the patient to avoid food containing seeds. Um, which is a controversial um, statement there because there are some studies out that say that it doesn't matter and some say to still say that, but we'll just consider it a uh, part of the NCLEX world. We'll still say avoid seeds. Uh, eat a high fiber diet. Uh, IV fluids if they're in the hospital because they're sick with diverticulitis. So IV fluids, antibiotics are important to decrease the bacteria in the GI tract which creates inflammation from the carbon dioxide buildup. So antibiotics in case there is a um, infectious process of bacterial infection going on. If it's really severe, the patient may need surgery to remove part of the colon or colonectomy. And they may need a colonoscopy, a colostomy if it's severe enough. Tell the patient to eat a high fiber diet to avoid laxatives and to drink eight to 10 glasses of fluid a day. We avoid laxatives because they can have a rebound, a const, rebound constipation if they overuse laxatives. So it's not a good idea to do that. It's better to have natural things like uh, prunes or something like that, green leafy vegetables. Increase their exercise will help GI motility and notify the physician if they see any blood or stool um, in their in their any blood in their stool or if they're having any abdominal pain. So what risks are increased for patients with diverticula during a colonoscopy? So if you know the patient has diverticulosis and they're going to have a colonoscopy, what are their risks? Their, their risks are different for this procedure than the normal person that does not have diverticula. So what is that risk? The risk is that because of the pockets, it looks like the lumen of the colon and it increases the risk of perforation of the scope through the colon wall and into the abdominal cavity during the procedure. For hernias, there could be a couple different kinds. Uh, the protrusion kind is of the intestines protrudes through the abdominal wall in vulnerable areas such as the umbilical or groin hernias are common. It is either reducible or irreducible. That means you can push it in or you can't push it in. Then there is strangulated, which can become gangrenous. So strangulated is when the intestines pokes through the abdominal wall and it's cutting off the circulation and that part of the bowel begins to die. So um, the inguinal is common, umbilical, femoral, or through an incision can happen um, with a hernia. 
So what you'll notice is abdominal swelling, uh, protrusion, and intestinal obstruction can happen. So we already looked at bowel obstruction. So here the hernia can cause a bowel obstruction if it clamps off the intestines. Pain, and is it reducible or incarcerated or is it stuck? So sometimes they can do a truss, which is a special type of underwear that they can wear to help hold the hernias in. They can look at it laparoscopically, laparoscopically and try to um, reduce the hernia. Or they can uh, do a hernioplasty where they'll actually put the hernia back in place and then they'll um, make the abdominal wall tighter. For nursing management, there's not much we can do for them except to monitor for signs of the obstruction and to manage any pain that they have may, they might become a surgery patient they should avoid constipation and avoid straining how do we assess for hernias so what what do we do to assess that they have a hernia we will have the patient cough or bear down and then it becomes more obvious so you're looking in the obvious places have them cough and bear down it'll poke out if they're in a severe pain, it may be strangulated, which is considered an emergency. Remember the bowel at this point is starting to die and that will become gangrenous, which is an infection. And then it'll become that whole hypovolemic shock scenario. Um, and then, then you'll have an obstruction and all the cascading events that lead from that. So the strangulation causes tissue necrosis, which means tissue death. So it stops the blood flow and then they, um, it becomes dead tissue inside the body which is not good. With colon and rectal cancer the main thing here is we need to know what the signs and symptoms of it is. We need to know preventative things so your annual um, uh, occult blood should be done after age 50 then at age 50, we should have our initial and first colonoscopy. Then the colonoscopy is repeated every 10 years if there's no findings. If they do have findings at the initial 50-year-old colonoscopy, then they will repeat based on the physician's um, orders, which would usually be three to five years after that first one. The only thing we do annually is the fecal occult blood stool. So the colon cancer pathophysiology usually begins with polyps, and that's what we're doing the colonoscopy for, is to look for polyps. You'll hear it called an adeno adenoma or an adenocarcinoma. Um, it could be re related to genetics or lifestyle, um, the environment causes, and then a very commonly colon cancer metastasizes to the liver. So the first symptom the patient will usually have is a change in bowel habits. So either they go from a, a regular bowel pattern to now they're constipated or now they have diarrhea all the time. So it would be like a, just a sudden or a gradual change in bowel habits without related to anything their, what, what they're eating or their activity level. They'll have blood in the stool. And then once you see blood in the stool, that's kind of a later sign um, that cancer is forming. They may have a distended abdomen. They will have weight loss. All cancers produce some sort of weight loss. Then they may have melanin or bright red blood per rectum. And that's what BRBPR means. I've seen many physicians abbreviate that in that way. And then the melanin is the blood tinged stool, which appears like a maroon color. When you do lab work on the patient, they may have low red blood cells because they've lost blood over a period of time very slowly. So they just have a trending low red blood cell count. They may also have a low hemoglobin if they've lost a lot of blood. So they'll do a CEA and AFP test to check for tumor markers may do a barium enema to see if there's a tumorous process going on in the colon. Then they'll decide to do a colonoscopy. And then they'll do the colonoscopy and a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. So here's a picture of, colonos of a colonoscopy on the bottom. And you can see the pictures of the um, cancer growing here. 
So you have the cancer um, in this area down here. And then on this side, you can see here how bloody it is. So it's very bloody. And this is a very big tumor um, on the right. And so is the left one. It's also a big tumor. Um, and you can see how it can almost um, create an obstruction there. So do you think that would be a functional or a mechanical um, bowel obstruction? Okay, so that would be a mechanical obstruction because the mechanics of the bowel there are growing and it's going to close it off eventually. Uh, functional is when you have other things like chemicals that or um, nerve processes that stop the bowel from functioning. So you do the colonoscopy and you see this cancer. Um, they will try to take it out sometimes with the scope what they can. Uh, they'll burn off those parts that are bleeding. They will um, prepare them for, they'll usually prepare them for surgery soon after this. So other options are radiation, um, go ahead and taking out the whole part of the colon. So that's the preferred method is to just remove the part that's got cancer in it. And then you're basically cured. So it really does uh, cure a lot of patients. If it's just confined to the bowels, you can just take it out. Okay, so when you have a patient, when you have a patient that has colon cancer diagnosed through a colonoscopy, when the patient comes back, you will keep them um, on clear liquids until the surgery decision is made and that is because the bowels are already prepped for the surgery. They've already done the bowel prep, so they'll have to uh, get sober from the, whatever medications they gave them in the procedure. They'll have to be awake enough to understand and have informed consent done with the surgery. So the patient has the option to decline or move forward with the surgery that could possibly cure them or they can go home and think about it, come back, do the bowel prep again, or they can decide to do other things. So it's up to the patient too to have a hand in their care. We'll make sure we do our education on the screening. So cold blood can be done yearly, but the colonoscopy is only every 10 and then every three to five, depending on what the, they find in the colonoscopy. However, they can uh, recommend a, a colonoscopy for younger than 50 if there's a family history or uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, the next one is hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids are just dilated veins around the anal sphincter. We've heard of hemorrhoids before. You may have even had problems with them before, but it's usually related to chronic straining, constipation, uh, diarrhea can weaken the tissue, uh, prolonged sitting like desk, desk jobs. Um, those type of office environments where there's a lot of sitting can create hemorrhoids. So we'll have to do some nursing things that help prevent that. So what would you do? Or you would just, you know, get up every hour and walk around for 10 minutes or whatever it is that you can do to help prevent um, hemorrhoids. So chronic straining, okay, we'll increase fiber in your diet, drink more water, that sort of stuff. Uh, external hemorrhoids are usually soreness and lumps, and they may bleed also. Internal hemorrhoid, hemorrhoids may also bleed. They can become anemic if the, it's a chronic problem. And he, internal hemorrhoids can go um, can protrude outward also. So what do we do for hemorrhoids surgically? There are some treatments out there. If the hemorrhoids are severe enough, they can have a hemorrhoidectomy where they just take it off with conventional surgery or what's most common is the banding ligation. So here you see a picture of a band ligation. So a hemorrhoid banding ligation. So what it is, it's a scope and they put it in the sigmoid and into the rectum there and they turn it upside down or backwards and they take the hemorrhoids. They look like just purple vessels there that are, are that are big and they take the scope and they suck it up into this device it's a vacuum and it sucks the hemorrhoid up and then they pop the little rubber bands off at the bottom you can see the ligated hemorrhoid so they'll pop the little bands off and um so here they'll pop the band off and it creates a little rubber band and this is the hemorrhoid it'll fall off in about a week 
So here's where the nursing care comes into play. When they get out of their procedure, they have so much fullness in their bottom, they feel like they have to poop. So as a nurse, we have to tell them, you can't, um, you can't, it's, you don't have to poop and don't strain because it's not that. For the nursing management, we can have the patient take a sits bath. So the purpose of a sits bath is to keep the area clean, but however, it does have some um, soothing properties about the sits bath. Uh, we need to avoid straining at all costs. We don't want to pop any of those things down there. Have a soft diet for about five days. Increase uh, PO fluids. Take stool softeners and increase their fiber. And remember that the ligations uh, will fall off in about a week. So a home health nurse reviews the health history of a client who has hemorrhoids. Which factor most likely contribute to the development of the client's hemorrhoids? Taking a daily stool softener, history of ulcerative colitis, frequent constipation, occupation of a computer programmer. And the answer is frequent constipation is the best answer here. Most likely contribute to the development of the client's hemorrhoids is constant or frequent constipation. Besides increasing the consumption of bulk from these stools, what is the most appropriate instruction the nurse can give the client with hemorrhoids? Do we want to say eat small meals frequently, drink eight glasses of water a day, take a daily laxative, or reduce the intake of refined sugar? The correct answer is to increase your water. So drink eight glasses of water a day. We don't want to take a daily laxative because then you can have rebound constipation from taking the laxative too frequently and the other two do not do anything for um, preventing hemorrhoids. A client has hemorrhoids surgically removed. Uh, the nurse is assisting with giving a client post-op sits bath. What's the best way to evaluate the effectiveness of the sits bath for this client? Is it the client's rectum is less painful? The client's decision is clean and well approximated. The client feels refreshed. The client has no evidence of a hematoma. So like I said before, the purpose of the SITS bath is to prevent infection. And here the client's decision is clean and well approximated. So that means that the incision is looking very well. For an anal rectal abscess, this is a collection of an infectious process of pus collection between the internal and external sphincters. It's usually transmitted via anal intercourse where a pathogen enters the tissues and begins to form an abscess. You know, a patient will complain of pain, edema, swelling. There'll be a mass there. They will develop a fever from the infection and foul smelling drainage. We'll give pain medicine, antibiotics, and the patient may need to have an IND to drain the incision. An anal fissure is a tear. So a fissure is a tear in uh, the anal area from constipation or an anal trauma. They will have bleeding. They may have um, an anoscope. And that's just a little circular uh, visualization device that the gastroenterologist can use. They'll be just given some topical creams, some uh, sitch baths, maybe uh, some surgical excision if it's big enough. However, a fistula is one of the, there is tunneling that occurs, an anal tract formation. Um, so what happens is you can have, the most common one is from the vaginal wall down through the anus. So you have a, um, a perianal fistula. And it can be from an inadequate healing of an anal rectal abscess, or it could be from inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Uh, pain, redness, or apparent, they may get a scope to look at it. Antibiotics or a fistula, fistulectomy or um, a non cutting septum is another kind of procedure they can do to help this. So patients who have anal fistulas or if they have a, uh, um, a, 
uh, a perianal fistula where it goes into the vaginal area. You don't have to think about their life. Their uh, if they're if the woman is married to a man, then maybe um, you know having intercourse would be very painful for that person. A polynidal cyst um, is usually something that we talk about in the neuro chapter. It's the sacro, sacral area and it's an infection of the hair follicle because sometimes the um, um, dimple there, the polynidal area, the sacrum area, uh, indicates that there might be something wrong with the spinal canal tract formation. And that's why we talk about it in neuro sometimes. Um, it can be from inadequate personal hygiene. Now, I've seen uh, a lot of army soldiers develop polynidal cysts and sinuses because of the, um, the harsh conditions that they have to endure with a lot of sweating and not being able to shower as much as they like. So if they're a man and they've got hair um, in their sacral area a lot, so that can develop into a um, cyst there. Now, it's, it's abundant hair and pain swelling. It's very purulent drainage. It drains a lot. It's like an abscess, so they might need an incision. It's a deep cut to take it out, and then they'll get a lot of packing, and then they'll have a wound healing um, that happens via secondary intention. That means it got, it's got to heal from the inside out, and so that's why we're going to do packing.